Latina Medio Dynamo Nellie Gallon, dubbed the Tropical Tycoon by the New York Times Magazine, is one of the entertainment industry's saddiest firebrand talents. She's a successful producer, motivational speaker, entrepreneur, and a galvanizing power broker in the Latino world. Nellie, a former president of the Telemundo Network, has owned and operated her own media company since 1994. Her company has launched 10 groundbreaking television channels in Latin America, has produced a staggering 600 episodes of programming that crosses all genres, from reality series to sitcoms, from telenovelas to talk shows in both English and Spanish. Nelly also created the smash box reality hit, The Swan, and wrote the best-selling companion book, The Swan Curriculum. Recently, she appeared on NBC hit The Celebrity Apprentice with Donald Trump. She had a deal with Omarosa, which to me would have been a hard thing. I bet she has some good stories. She raised $250,000 for her charity, Count Me In, and furthered her reputation as one of the nation's top female moguls. Nellie is frequently cited for her influential work outside the industry as a board member for Count Me In. Count Me In, if, if you don't know, is the nation's leading nonprofit for rider for women's entrepreneurs. It's, it's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer network, the Center for the Advancement of Women and the Smithsonian Institution. Nellie is the original Ms. Mogul, is also a devoted single mom to her eight-year-old son. Please join me in welcoming Nellie Gallum. You know, listening to my bio, I think the most important thing I can tell all of you is how I got to the point that I even thought that I could do any of those things coming from where I came from. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the story. Um, my parents are from Cuba, and I was born in Cuba myself. And I came to this country when I was five years old. So as a little kid, I had to translate for my parents. I had to take care of everything. My mother, I became like my mom's like best friend. So it was, I grew up with this family that you know, came to this country and really like had lost all their money. They really didn't know how to make money. They all went to work for other people. My parents worked 24 hours a day. They were very hard working, but they were very like scared of like Americanos. You know, it was always like, oh, you know, don't, don't rock the boat because we might lose our job because we have to support you kids and don't do anything that will upset anybody. You know, it was very like kind of unempowered, you know? And I had a life-changing experience happen to me in high school, actually two of them, that really kind of changed my life. And one is that my parents, you know, I was a really good student. I had to be a good student because I had to do everything in my household, you know? And, it, and they decided to send me to all-girl Catholic school, the Academy of the Holy Angels. And they sent me there, and it was a very expensive school, and they kind of didn't put two and two together about how they were going to pay for it. So like, you know, a lot of us, you know, we listen to our parents at night and I would overhear them and they'd be like, ay Dios mío, como vamos a pagar la escuela, how are we going to pay for this? And the lady down the street had, was an Avon lady. And one day she said to me, uh, listen, if you want, if you want to sell Avon in school, I'll give you some Avon products and then you can get some free lipsticks for yourself. And I thought, forget the free lipsticks, I need dough. And I went to see her and I said, listen, Forget the free lipsticks. I need, I'll do it, but it's got to be 50-50. And the first week I sold Avon, I made 200 bucks cash. And I started making all this money. I was like, you know, in my locker in school, it was like, smell really good. It was all, and my, my, my locker became like the hot point for all the girls in school. They'd be like, oh my gosh, she's got great stuff in there. And I was making a lot of money. So I go back, and any of you that have ethnic parents, you know, like they're very proud. So what I did is I, pay, I went to the nuns and I go, listen, my dad is really proud. I'm going to pay for my school because I'm selling Avon, but you've got to send a note home and like tell him that I got a scholarship. And my dad, like, by the way, whenever I was overhearing my parents, my mother would go, Dios mío, how are we going to pay for this? And my father would go, don't worry, Jesus will help us. So the nuns sent the note home. I took it home and my mother goes, Arsenio, ¿qué dice la nota? What does the note say? And he goes, what did I tell you? Your daughter is a genius and Jesus helped us after all. You know, that was like my first brush with entrepreneurship because as a lot of you know, like, I mean, in our families, a lot of our families, what the heck do we know about entrepreneurship? Like our parents can't even get it together. So for me, it was like, you know, it was like the first time I thought, oh, I could go sell something and make money and make kind of a lot of money. 
Well, I had a second traumatic experience in that school. The, the, the all-girl Catholic school thing was just not working for me. The second experience was like a year and a half later, I, I get called in and I get told that I was plagiarizing a story that I had not written because it was too heavy and like depressive for like a 15 year old. And I go, well, you try to raise your parents and see if you write depressing stories, okay? So they suspended me for three days. And the three days I was suspended, my mother goes, ay Dios mío, eso es sacrilegio, it's sacrilege, what have you done to the nuns? It was all about poor nuns instead of poor me, you know? And I was like, mom, I didn't do anything. I really didn't, I mean, I wrote the freaking article. And so I was so mad, I was mad at my parents, I was mad at the nuns, was, and in the three days I was home, I wrote an article. And it's like, I would have never had the guts to write this, except I was so mad. And I wrote this article about why you should never send your kids to all-girl Catholic school. And the only magazine I read at the time was Seventeen Magazine. So I looked inside and I thought, who is the editor, the article's editor? And I read her name and I sent it to her. And my, I gave it to my father to mail because I didn't even, you know, he, it's like, here, Dad, mail this for me. He goes, ¿Qué es esto? Seventeen Magazine. Like, do you really think they're going to publish something you write? Are you crazy? I go, whatever, Mom, Dad, just, just mail it, okay? I go back to school and three months pass. And like three months later, I get a call from Seventeen Magazine. And that lady that I had sent it to goes, we wanna, we're going to pay you $100 and we're going to publish your article. I thought it was very funny because I, I wrote it kind of funny. So a couple months, this is now the end of my sophomore year, like the tail end. And the article gets published. And I'm like the coolest kid in school. Everybody read the article. Everybody's coming up to me, high-fiving me, like, oh, my God, you got published in Seventeen Magazine? And then I hear the loudspeaker, and it's like, Nelly Galan, come to the principal's office. I go, oh, I'm screwed. I am really screwed. I go to see the head principal, and she's like, that article you wrote is unacceptable to us, and we're expelling you from the school. And I thought, how the hell do I tell my parents this? This is not good. I go home. And I go, mommy, me botaron de la escuela. They kicked me out of school. My father goes, you're going to have to go back and apologize. We're going to have to. I go, I'm not apologizing, dad. I didn't do anything wrong. The, the reason we came to this country is to have freedom of speech. My father goes, ¿Qué es eso? ¿Qué es freedom? I, no, in no country there's freedom of speech. Don't you know that? Don't be naive. So I decided to call the Board of Ed of the state of New Jersey. And it just turned out that the Board of Ed was in my town, Tina. And this, this black guy answers the phone, and I go, listen, I just got expelled from my school, and I don't even know what to do. I'm confused. I, I just don't even know. I, I don't know if I should just leave. What do I do? And he goes, well, why did you get expelled? I go, because I wrote a story, and it got published, and it was against the school. And he goes, they can't do that. That's against the law. And I go, really? And he goes, come in and see me right away. And I went to see him, and thank you, God, for this guy. He decided to take on this case. And two days later, I became the most famous teenager in New Jersey because I was all over the press as the teenager that was like fighting the nuns. And so I fought the nuns and they, ha they ended up having to take me back, which was not pretty, can I tell you? But they had to take me back. But he, something very magical happened because of this whole story. I get a call from Seventeen Magazine and every year they had a guest editorship position that was like a paid internship that they usually gave to juniors in college. And the woman, because she like they had followed my story and they followed that I was fighting the nuns and that I got in trouble. And they're like, we want to offer you the guest editorship for the fall. And we will get the nuns to give you like a leave of absence from school. And it's going to be great for you because it'll get you into any college you want. So I went to work for Seventeen Magazine, which in, in the year that would have been my junior year of high school. And from that moment on, my life changed radically because I realized, and I think this is important for all of you to hear, that it, you know sometimes in life you have to take radical risks. And you know even if even when everyone tells you that they're wrong, because not not everybody gets it. They don't get what's in your soul. And you know that that experience, and it's interesting because a couple years ago, I was called by. Harvard was doing a study on kids that were expelled from school. And what effect did expulsion have on their life? And actually, most of them, it ruined their life. 
because the way they took it is that they were a failure, that they did something wrong, because that's how we all grow up thinking like we're the bad ones. Somebody else, like an institution or somebody else must know something we don't know. And in fact, you know, I, and they were like kind of shocked that I had had such a great reaction. And I, and I think it was because to give my parents credit, you know, my parents had no money and they were really down and out and they really didn't speak the language. But the one thing that they had is they were really proud to be Latino. And the one thing that they told me when I was a little kid and I came home and I said, mommy, this kid in school called me a spick and oh my God. And I was crying and she goes, are you kidding me? Is he ignorant or what? She goes, you come from a beautiful place. You speak two languages. You have the best of both worlds. You get to be American and Latina. And I think that even though they didn't have all the other stuff, they made me feel like, you know, I felt like I have all the power that they don't have. And I know what my worth is. And I know that, that I, my parents didn't come all the way from some, some, such a long way and bring me to this country for me to do nothing with my life. And I knew that I, that I, was, that I had a mission. And when you figure it out, then you, the whole world opens up. And I'll tell you what that was for me. After Seventeen Magazine, I, was, I had like another blessing, which is this Latina lady was the producer of the teenage version of 60 Minutes, the TV show. And she called me up. She was reading my articles in Seventeen Magazine. And she said, you know, I'm starting this TV show for teenagers. And I think you should come and apply. And I lucked out because I got the job. And I was like a teen reporter on a show. And I spent two and a half years traveling all over the United States shooting interviews with people. So it was an incredible, incredible thing. And off of that, I got recruited to CBS Network in Boston to be a trainee, to be a network news reporter. I lucked out because one of the people that I interviewed was a guy by the name of Norman Lear, way before you guys' time, but a very big TV producer. And he had bought a little rinky-dinky little TV station that was Spanish in New Jersey. And he's like, you know, I like you. You want to come and work for my little TV station? And I go, Spanish TV? Ugh! Gross. I don't want to do that. He said to me, he goes, do you want to do what other people do? Or do you want to do what you know how to do from your soul? And I thought, what do you mean by that? And he goes, well, your parents are Latinos and you have all these great stories. And who better to make TV shows for Latinos than somebody who knows? And I go, oh, duh, that sounds right to me. And at 22 years of age, I went to run this little TV station that was uh, an independent station in New York. And I worked there for three years like a dog. And I always say I was the Burger King manager because I worked 24 hours a day. I was like a slave. Three years of being there, but I really learned a lot about how to run a business with somebody else's money. I made every, like I would sometimes make a mistake and I go, oops, how can I cover this mistake? <laughs> I gotta figure it out. I gotta make money somewhere else because I would like blow money. You know, I made every mistake in the book I made on somebody else's business. And one day I went into work and um, the lawyer for Norman Lear called me up and he goes, we have good news for you. We sold the company. I go, what do you mean you sold the company? Right? And I was just like, this is my baby. This is my burger kit that you're taking away from me. I was just insulted. Right? And I said, I want to go see Norman Lear and Jerry Prancher, the two owners. I go, I want to go see them right now. And I went to see this guy, Jerry, who was like Norman's partner, but he was like, it was good cop, bad cop. He was the bad cop. And I went to see him and I go, how could you do this to me? I built this baby from scratch. I've worked 24 hours a day. How could you sell it and not tell me? And he goes, young lady, those are my chips. You want to play? Go get your own chips. In that moment, I knew that I would never work for anybody else again. I just thought, you know what? I'm not going to kill myself and like have somebody else be able to, you know, I wasn't even thinking the money thing yet. I was just thinking like, I killed myself and he sold the company. How could he do that to me? And I just thought, I'm never working for anybody again. That's it. I'm starting my own business. And I was 25 years old. And I decided I'm going to go make TV shows for Latinos because I had just run the station and I never had enough TV shows. And I thought, well, if I don't, if I don't have enough TV shows, the next people that buy it are going to need the TV shows. So I start this company and I go around and, I, and I'm going to every network and I go, I want to sell Latino shows. And they're like, that's nice. We're not interested. And, and this is an important thing I want to, it took me four years, 
four years to get the first company to buy my shows. And the reason that that did not freak me out is because the one, the, you know, the, the few times I got to spend time with my two bosses, um, I said, well, how did you guys start the company? And they go, well, you know, it took us 10 years to get our first piece of business. So in my mind, I thought, well, it takes a very long time to get a business to work. So I didn't have this expectation that it was going to work quick. I knew it was going to take a long time. And I did odd jobs. I knew what I had to do because since I had already seen these two bosses I had, that I didn't think they were smarter than me. And they were like multimillionaires already. I'm like, if they could do it, I could do it. So four years later, I got my first piece of business. And that piece of business was HBO, was, was launching HBO in Latin America. And they were like, can you go to Latin America and figure out how to launch HBO? Do you speak Spanish? I go, yeah, duh. And they sent me down there and they had sent three MBAs from Harvard for three years down there and they couldn't figure out how to do it because none of them spoke Spanish. And in three months, I had the channel up and running. And then I get a call from ESPN and they go, can you launch ESPN for us? And I go, oh, sports, I really hate sports. Let me charge them double. That way they won't give me the business. I charge them double and they go, okay. Went down to Latin America and I launched ESPN. And then I got a call from this guy that nobody knew who he was at the time, but now he's the owner of Fox TV, Rupert Murdoch. And he called me and he goes, I want you to launch six channels for me in Latin America. I go, oh, I don't want to go do six channels. I want to do programming. And he goes, you're wrong. I go, what do you mean I'm wrong? And he goes, well, you've got to go build the channels that then carry the programming. He's like, so if you build the channels later on, you'll, do, you'll be the queen of all the programming. And I go, well, what will it take for you to do this for me? And I go, well, I've got to practically move to Latin America. I need you to loan me the money to start my own company. And he goes, well, how much money do you need? And I thought in my mind, I thought, I need a million bucks. But see, the old boss that I had, the one that sold the company, he said, whenever you're going to go raise money, ask for five times what you need because you're going to run out of money. So I go, I need five million bucks. And he goes, okay. And he loaned me $5 million in 1994. So I started my own company. And that's the time when I launched 10 TV channels. And I started making shows and I, I started doing all this stuff, um, which I also, I have to say again, the other thing that happened that was amazing is that my bosses told me, whenever you start making money, don't go bling bling spending money. Go buy the buildings that, you're, that, you're built, that your company is in. And so because I just followed what they did, I started buying buildings. And like before you knew it, I had like a little real estate empire going too. So I went from like zero and I made nothing for four years to like two years after Rupert Murdoch loaned me the money, I paid him back and I was a millionaire. And that little TV station that I ran had been bought by an insurance company and a bunch of other stations were bought and it had become the Telemundo Network. And it was in bankruptcy. And I went to Rupert Murdoch and I said, we have to buy it, we have to buy this network. And we went after it to buy it and we lost. And this other company bought it, Sony. And when Sony bought it, the president of Sony came and said, do you wanna come and run this network? So I was so caught up in being this Latina woman running a Latino network, I took the job. I kept, thank God, I kept my company running. I never got rid of my company. But I went and I became an employee for Sony for three years. Big mistake. I mean, I did it and I'm glad I did it because, I, because now I have no doubt. But to go back after you've been an entrepreneur to work for somebody else is the worst. Because you realize, like, these people don't even run this company right. Like, they, they waste money. When you're running your own company, it's your electricity, it's your everything. You watch everything. But anyway, because of all that, then I got asked to do the uh, NBC Celebrity Apprentice. And, you know, I have to say, you guys, when I got the call, I got very, very, very scared. And then I thought, well, anything that makes you scared, you have to do. And I went and did it, and it was the most magical experience of my life. Because I got to go and almost, like, I spent time with other people in other fields, and I got to really, really look at you know, how other people, how they are successful. And I think a lot of success is looking at other people and saying, what have they figured out that I haven't? And just copy it. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. What have I learned? And if, like, I wish somebody had told me at your age what I'm going to tell you. And the first thing is, I know that when you're a teenager, the number one thing you think is, is my life going to work out? Am I going to find the right guy? 
Am I going to make money? Is everything going to... And I, I wish somebody had said to me, don't worry, it all works out. It really does. Sometimes you hit really bad walls and you hit really... It's almost like a video game. You hit a... You know, you get to level two and then you got to go back to level one because you made a mistake. But it does work out. Enjoy this moment. This is a great moment that will never come back. But these are the things I would like to share with you that I think are like really important tools in life. Fear. I, I, I really feel like fear is my best friend. I have fear every day and I don't care how old I get or how smart I am or what I've accomplished, I have fear every day. And the only difference between human beings is who breathes through their fear and who doesn't. If you just know that you're not alone, everybody else has just as much fear as you do. And if you just know that when you feel fear, it's like a sign. It's something I have to do. Because life, you're only on this earth for so much time. So, you know, you might as well do everything you're supposed to be doing. When you feel fear, you should just go, ah, red flag, something I'm supposed to do. So it has to be like something you're very comfortable feeling because it tells you what's next. I could sit and give you an entire bio of all my failures. And you know what? I like failure. I even feel comfortable with it because I know when I fail, it's I'm learning something so the next success will come. You know, I, you know, for me to sell one TV show, how many TV shows do you think I go out and sell that don't get sold? A lot. How much money do you think I invest in projects that never turn out to be anything? A lot. But all it takes is one to succeed that it looks like I'm a, a success. In fact, if I'm not in the game and I'm not trying things, I'm never going to succeed. So... Failure is my other best friend. Fear and failure are my two best friends. And I suggest you get very comfortable with those two feelings because you're going to get to where you need to go a lot faster when you just realize like you're not alone. You will fail a million times and you're going to be fearful even more than that. Follow your bliss, the backup position. And what I mean by that is sometimes you get told, oh, you're such a good artist. You should be an artist. Well, that's great. And you're probably a great artist. But that doesn't feed your family. So sometimes in life, you have, to, you have to, and I've learned this, and this is something that I really fought for a long time. Sometimes you just have to go make money. Sometimes you just have to start a business. You don't have to 100% love that business, but you just have to do a business because eventually you'll get to the thing that you love. But sometimes you just have to have a backup position in the meantime, and that doesn't mean you're selling out. That just means you're a logical woman and you're a powerful woman. And a powerful woman means that she's self-sufficient and makes her own money. The truth of the matter is that you're much happier. I don't care what man you're with. You're much happier when you are complete by yourself. And number one place you're complete by yourself is economically. Okay, don't live large. And you know what, you guys? You have to live the same. Like, you have to be humble the whole way through. Like, you know what? You don't need... You, and especially now, we're in a very tough economic time in this country. I think it's great because everybody's going to really come, come back down to earth. It's like if you always are cautious with your money and you're careful, even in bad times or good times, nothing changes. You don't have ups and downs. And like the, the money that you make, you always have to think like an investor. Like, what am I going to put my money in in case that guy goes away, in case something ha horrible happens? And I notice like a lot of people live month to month. You cannot live like that. I wrote down, you have to give to yourself. Like, you know how I did the facial mask that burned my face? It's okay because you guys have to do stuff for yourselves all the time. Like, you got to look good. You got to feel good. Everything can't be, like, to help other people, do for other people, and then you're, like, the last one because then you're not feeling good about yourself and you have no confidence. How can you conquer the world with no confidence? Like, you have to give to yourself. I think life is a puzzle. You know, like, you, something will happen to you like what I'm saying, you, you're, you're born in the wrong family, bad things happen, and you go, oh my God, why is that happening to me? I don't deserve that. And life is a puzzle. You, as you get older, that's the only good thing about getting older, let me tell you. You start figuring out the puzzle. You go, oh, that's why that happened. Because I had to learn that, because now I get this job offer, or I get this, this business that I'm starting, and if that horrible thing hadn't happened to me, I wouldn't know how to do this. So like, even when really bad things happen to you, you just have to know there's a reason that you can't understand right in this moment. And I promise you this is true. Like, you guys are going to remember that I told you that. Okay, this is the other one. Life doesn't get easier. You know, like, has life been easy for all of you? I don't think so, right? We've had ups and downs. 
life doesn't get easier. So you have to just roll with it. It's kind of like, you know what? It is like a video game. You get to level one and then you, you have obstacles and then you get to level two and every, every place along the way, sometimes you go backwards and you just have to keep going because you get through these humps and you get to the other side of the hump and there's goodness again. Sometimes in life when things aren't working out, you know, like sometimes you try something so, so, so hard and it's just not working. I say, get in the boat and let the river take you. Sometimes you just have to know the universe is sending you a big old message. Like you're not on the right path. Hello, you're doing the wrong thing. Just chill and the right path will appear. And that's true of guys when you're dating and that's true of work and that's true of friends. When something's so hard, it's just not jiving. You just have to go, you know, this isn't working out. And you have to really listen to that message. And finally, I wanted to tell you what I've learned that's the biggest lesson for me that took me many years. I'm gonna save you a lot of years here. You know, all the things you think are gonna make you happy when you're very young, like, oh, if I could just find the right guy, I'd be happy. Oh, if I could just find the right job, I'd be happy. Later on, you're gonna go, oh, if I could just have the right kid or a bunch of kids, that would make me happy. And you realize that you might achieve some of those things and they don't make you very happy for very long. Not because maybe you do find the right guy, but then you, you know, you're used to him and it doesn't make you happy anymore. That's life. And I find that there is something that makes you happy, really makes you happy. And it's luckily it's something you can control. And that is to grow every day. And that means coming to this event. It means that if you have to take a class to learn something that you're not good at, you take that class and it makes you feel good. I just went back to school and I'm in a master's PhD program in psychology. What the hell do I have to do that for? Because I want to grow. I don't want to be a lady in my later years who just thinks, oh, I'm making TV shows. To me, that's even like ridiculous at a certain age. So I want to grow. I wanted to go back to school and I wanted to inspire my brain to think a different way. And I think each of you has to think, what is the way that I need to grow? Because at every age, there's a different thing. Some of you might need to go to therapy. Some of you might need to go to see a counselor or a priest or whatever, whatever you believe in. Just to, to, you know, at this age, it's a lot of cleaning up your, your childhood. Whatever you need to, to grow and be better so you can get to the next spot in the video game, you've got to do it. And I cannot tell you how much happiness it brings you because you feel proud of yourself that you did something for yourself. And that's something that no one can take away from you. What's in your soul that you've brought to yourself, no one can take away from you. So I leave you with that message. Grow every day. Thank you.